Hi everyone, and welcome back to my channel. In lesson 4, we kick things off with our very first real project, controlling an electric motor using the S7300 PLC. We learned how to create a new project, set up the hardware, and dive into programming. We covered some basic bit logic instructions, like normally open and normally closed contacts, as well as how to work with coils normal, set, and reset coils. And of course, we tested the project to make sure it worked perfectly. Now in this lesson, we're going to take it up a notch. We'll dive deeper into bit logic instructions, explore flip-flop instructions, and more. I've set up the hardware and designed this project so you can clearly understand today's lesson. In this project, we can start and stop the motor from two different locations. When the motor starts, a light flashes to indicate that it's running. Pretty cool, right? Let me break it down for you. I have two sets of start and stop buttons. Press the first start button and the motor runs. Press the stop button and the motor stops. It's the same with the second set of buttons. This setup allows us to control the motor from both locations, which is a common feature in industrial environments. I've also added a light that flashes to indicate the motor is running just like in a real-world application. Before we dive deeper, if you're new here, I recommend checking out the earlier lessons to get the full picture. But don't worry if you're pressed for time, I'll give you a quick recap of what we've covered so far, so you won't miss a thing. Now let's begin by creating a new project in Somatic Manager and naming it Control Motor. Next, I'll insert a Somatic 300 station. As you can see, the program now guides us through the hardware configuration. As we've learned, the first step is to insert a rack. Next, I need to insert the CPU. For this project, we'll be using the 312C model and I'll insert it into the rack. Let's check the input and output addresses. As you can see, the input and output addresses start at 124. In the previous lesson, I changed these addresses to zero, but for this video, I'll leave them at the default values so you can practice using these addresses. With the hardware configuration complete, I'll click the Save and Compile icon to proceed with the program. I'll come back to the CPU properties later to set up the flashlight program. Now let's open the OB1 block, where we'll write our main program. In the last video, we used a set coil to start the motor and keep it running until we press the stop button, which activated the reset coil. But this time, I want to show you a more flexible and professional approach using flip-flop instructions. Flip-flop instructions are essential for controlling outputs based on specific input conditions. They allow an output to remain in a set or reset state until another condition changes it. In Somatic Manager, we have two primary flip-flop instructions, RS and SR. Let's start with the RS flip-flop. 
Both flip-flop instructions have two main inputs. The first input is labeled R, which stands for reset. The second input is labeled S, which stands for set. We also need to define an address for the flip-flops that store the condition of whether the flip-flop is active or inactive. This can be either a memory bit M or a physical output Q, depending on the needs of your program. The flip-flop block also has one output. You can use this output in your program logic or leave it unused if it's not needed directly. In these flip-flops, when the set S input is activated, the assigned address and the flip-flops output becomes active and stays active until the reset R input is triggered. The SR flip-flop works similarly to the RS flip-flop, but with one key difference. In an RS flip-flop, the set S input has priority over the reset R input. But in an SR flip-flop, the reset R input has priority over the set S input. To break it down, let's take a look at how the RS flip-flop behaves based on input conditions. If only the set S input is active, the flip-flop output and the assigned address becomes active. If only the reset R input is active, the output and the address are deactivated. But if both set and reset inputs are active at the same time, the set input takes priority, so the output remains activated. Let's now take a look at how the SR flip-flop behaves based on input conditions. If only the set S input is active, the flip-flop output and the assigned address becomes active. If only the reset R input is active, the flip-flop output and the address are deactivated. But if both set and reset inputs are active at the same time, the reset input takes priority, so the output is deactivated. Now that you understand how flip-flops work, let's return to our program and keep going. First, I insert an SR flip-flop into Network 1. This helps us control the motor using start and stop buttons. Next, I define the inputs and outputs. 1. For the set start input, I add a normally open contact to represent the first start button. This contact is connected to input I124.0. 2. For the reset stop input, I add a normally closed contact to represent the first stop button. This contact is connected to input I124.1. 1. After that, I need to define the address to store the SR flip-flop state. I could choose the controlled output address here, but instead of controlling the output directly, I choose a memory bit with the address M0.0 to store the flip-flop state. This is the common way to define the address. The reason for using a memory bit instead of an output is that, depending on the program, I might need to use the same flip-flop with the same inputs. In this case, I don't need to define a new flip-flop with the same inputs. Instead, I can use a normally open contact and assign it the address of the flip-flop M0.0. This allows me to reuse it without creating duplicate flip-flops, making the program clearer and more efficient. Finally, I add a normal coil with the address Q124.0. This coil will control the output that turns the motor on or off.
So far, we've set up motor control using two push buttons, one for start and one for stop. However, we also need to add a second set of start and stop buttons for more control. Now, let's add the second start and stop buttons to our program. In a previous lesson, we learned about parallel and series connections in ladder logic. Specifically, we saw that if we want to start the same action from two different buttons, we need to connect them in parallel. To add the second start button, I'll insert a normally open contact located at I124.2. I'll place this normally open contact in parallel with the first start button at the set S input of the flip-flop. To do this, I'll select an open branch from the toolbar and add a normally open contact. Then, I'll define its address as I124.2. And finally, select the close branch to complete the parallel connection. This setup will allow both start buttons to control the flip-flop, giving us more flexibility in motor control. Now it's time to add the last input, the second stop button, which is connected to the fourth input at address I124.3. To add this stop button to the flip-flop, I'll insert a normally closed contact in parallel with the first normally closed contact which represents the first stop button at the reset R input of the flip-flop. To do this, I will again select an open branch, add a normally closed contact. Define its address as I124.3 and finally select the close branch. In S7300 PLCs, the CPU's clock memory bits M addresses can be used to implement simple cyclic timing functions, such as generating flashing signals for indicators, blinking lights, or periodic control pulses. By enabling the clock memory in the CPU properties and assigning a starting address, a range of predefined frequency signals becomes available for user programs eliminating the need to create additional timer instructions for basic timing tasks. This feature offers an efficient and resource-saving method for implementing simple timing behaviors in automation applications. To configure this, open the hardware configuration in your project, access the CPU properties, and navigate to the clock memory section. Now click on the clock memory checkbox to activate it. After that, you can assign a desired memory byte, for example, I want to assign a byte A1. Now that M byte 1 has been defined as a memory clock, each bit within this memory toggles on and off at distinct, fixed time intervals. For example, bit 0 toggles with a 0.1 second period, bit 1 with 0.2 seconds, bit 2 with 0.4 seconds, and so on. In our case, we utilize bit 5, which oscillates with a 1 second cycle remaining on for 1 second and off for the next. These toggling bits can be directly used in the program to generate flashing behavior, eliminating the need for additional timers. For instance, using M1.1 will cause a lamp to flash every one second automatically. Now that I've activated the clock and defined its address, I click on Save and Compile, then proceed to write the program. Our goal is to make a light flash every one second to indicate that the motor is running. So what should I do? First, I insert a new network. In this network, one, 
I add a normally open contact and assign it the address M0.0. This is the same memory bit used by the flip-flop for the motor. By using this, the light will only flash when the motor is running no need to duplicate the flip-flop. 2. Next, I insert a second normally open contact with the address M1.5. This is the CPU clock bit we activated earlier from the hardware configuration and it toggles every one second. 3. Finally, I add an output coil with the address Q124.1, which is connected to the light that will indicate the motor status. This way, the light will flash once every second whenever the motor is running. Now, let's test this program with real hardware. To do this, first I download the hardware configuration to the PLC. Then, I download the program to the PLC. Finally, I go online with the PLC by clicking the glasses icon on the toolbar. As you can see, I am now online with the PLC. And in the program too, I can see the actions. Let's test it together. I press the first start button and the motor starts running. I stop it using the second stop button. Then, I start it again using the second start button and stop it with the first stop button. Everything works perfectly in both directions. I hope this video was helpful. I tried to explain everything in a simple and clear way so that everyone can understand. If you have any questions about PLC programming or electrical topics, feel free to ask in the comments I'm here to help. And by the way, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to support the channel.